Good morning. Welcome to worship here at First United Methodist Church of Del Mar. We're very glad to have you with us on this beautiful Sunday morning. Call your attention to the announcements that are listed there in the bulletin. Um, just want to point out that uh, spiritual conversations topic and additional information will be available in next week's e-newsletter. So if you're somebody who participates in that, watch for that. Um, but the date is there for the 27th in the Wesley Boardroom. Um, also, uh, coming up this week, uh, we have an Ad Council meeting on Monday and a Reconciling Ministries team meeting. So, lots of things going on here this week. I just want to offer uh, thanks to those who uh, helped to uh, provide a welcome to folks who came for the uh, concert on Friday evening. Uh, it was a, a good-sized group, not huge, but, uh, but a nice group, and uh, those who were there really appreciated it. So, we're hoping to have Bobby Joe come back maybe someday. Uh, in a year or so when he's uh, touring through the area again. So um, hopefully some of the folks who were here will uh, will talk that up. And uh, Jeff and I were even just talking about um, uh, the possibility of, uh, I thought about maybe trying to have him here on a Saturday so that we could also have him for worship on a Sunday. So uh, we're going to see what we might be able to do with that. Um, there's also the staff appreciation dinner coming up, um, the Hope More Fear Less Town Hall coming up in October. We're really excited about that. Um, we have Sheriff Apple and our Bethlehem Police Chief, uh, Gina, and I'm not, I'm going to butcher her last name because I've heard it several times and I still get it wrong. So if anybody can pronounce our police chief's last name, go ahead. <laughs> no, nope, nobody's going to help me. Okay. So, uh, but she's, she's, uh, she's great and, and uh, we're looking forward to having both of them. Um, Lots of times with gun violence, you know, we, we think about things like school shootings and other things that are in the news, uh, but there's lots of ways in which gun violence happens in homes, even in suburban communities, as you're aware. And uh, I was just noting uh, also that uh, gun violence statistics also include people who take their own lives with guns. And so uh, gun safety and, uh, and the, the regulation of firearms in that way in households and in communities is really important as well. So we're looking forward to conversation uh, with our law enforcement officials in the area to learn what more we can do um, to help reduce gun violence in our midst. I uh, also want to mention that uh, you may be aware we have a pastor's discretionary fund um, that is used at times when uh, there's, there's need for individuals, uh, usually with some kind of relationship to the congregation, uh, uh, someone who's a friend of a friend or so forth. Um, so uh, over the last couple of years, we have used up funds that were in that at that point. We haven't made an appeal to replenish that. Um, uh, recently, we, uh, we used up the, basically the last of those. I think there's about $14 left. So uh, if that's something that you feel called to support and are able to support, um, you can do that uh, by uh, writing a check um, or you can uh, uh, just uh, make a donation and note that it's for the pastor's discretionary fund and we will be able to replenish those funds because I anticipate that there may be some more needs coming up in the near future. And now let us set our hearts and minds for worship. Thank you. 
scripture. Just make sure you have your bulletin to hand. Our first scripture reading comes from James chapter 3, verse 13, chapter 4, verses 3, and then 7 to 8a. If you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. Love. I invite the children to come forward and join me up front together. Actually, my son Sam preached at the Peru church this summer, and Heather has family who go to the Peru church. So we have lots of connections there, too. Very cool. Did you know there was a place called Peru up near Plaza? No. Isn't that crazy? So, all right. So today, we're going to be talking about prayer. Anybody here ever pray? When do you pray? Sometimes before bedtime. That's a good time. School. Okay. Do you ever pray? Never? Sometimes? Occasionally? Yeah. Here? No? <laughs> In Sunday school? At home? Yeah. Cool. I do it before dinner and before bed. Before dinner and before bed. Those are good times when lots of people pray. Yeah. How about you, Jerry? Um, wait, what? I pray at night. At night. Lots of people pray at night. How many of you pray at night? Yeah, that's a time when lots of people do, right? It's a good time to do that, to help us to rest, and we kind of take all the concerns and things from the day and hopefully try to give them to God to worry about later. Yeah. So when you pray, how do you pray? Do you pray out loud? 
Or do you pray quietly, like without words to the corporation? Do you pray quiet? Just kind of think about it? That's a good one. So do you use your own words? Yeah, that's good. That's good. What about you? I usually like pray out loud. Pray out loud? That's good. Yeah. So uh, when I was a kid, I read a book about um, somebody who was a Civil War general, and he was on the Confederate side. So we're going to ignore that part for now. <laughs> and we're going to, though, his name was uh, Stonewall Jackson. Have you ever heard of Stonewall Jackson? No. So, and he was kind of a weird person, actually. So he had a lot of crazy ideas. But one of the things I always remember reading that book about him was that he used to pray while he was riding his horse and, and with his eyes open. And most people then, especially a lot of people now, think when you pray, you should bow your heads, right? Maybe fold your hands this way or this way and you bow your head. Sometimes people kneel when they pray. Um, right? So people usually close their eyes, but he said he looked all through the Bible and it didn't say anywhere where you had to close your eyes. In fact, sometimes it said that when we pray, we should look up to the sky and maybe put our hands up. So sometimes people open their hands because that's a way of, of being open, right, to God. Or sometimes people hold hands when they pray with other people. So and sometimes when we pray before meals, that's what people do, right? Sometimes people stand up when they pray. In some, some Christian traditions, when you pray, you stand up or kneel. You don't sit. Sometimes we just sit, and that's okay, too. So what's really important is not necessarily a particular way. You don't have to kneel. You don't have to sit. You don't have to stand. You don't have to have your eyes open. You don't have to have your eyes closed. When you pray, what's really important is that you do it in a way that helps you to connect with God. Right? So for some people, that's in the morning at night, sometimes before meals is a good time to stop and be thankful for what we have and what we're going to have, be eating, and to remember also that there are lots of people that don't necessarily have things, right? So, um, so that's a good time too, but what's really most important when we pray is that we're focused on God, and one of the things about praying too is that um, a lot of times we use a lot of words, but sometimes you can just pray by saying, God, here I am. And just kind of being. So sometimes the times I pray the best are when I'm doing something like kayaking or canoeing or hiking or walking my dog or doing things like that because I'm just outdoors and that's the place sometimes where I can connect really well with God. Right? Or sometimes, is this your kitty? What's her name? What is that? It's your dog. So sometimes maybe just how you brownie can be kind of a prayer too, right? It can be sort of a prayer too, right? Just to feel safe and comfortable and good, right? Okay. All right. So now we're going to pray before we go to Sunday school. So often we bow our heads and, and close our eyes, but if that's not the best way for you to pray, then you figure out the best way for you to pray. All right? Let's have a prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you're always there for us and that you always know what's in our hearts. But we also give you thanks that we can stop and with our words or just our thoughts, connect with you and let you know what we need. And you can let us know how much you love you. You love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for coming up. I mentioned one of the needs that, uh, that we had uh, to uh, provide funds to help those in need. Um, uh, I just also want to uh, uh, give thanks for those who work very hard and diligently on all of our uh, missions here uh, that help support uh, our mission ministries. Uh, those who work in the thrift shops, uh, especially I know over at Treasure Cove this week, they were busy with their uh, turnover from summer to fall. Um, those who work downstairs at Blessed Bargains, um, 
who put in a lot of time and, uh, and quietly do that. And, uh, and also let you know, there are a lot of folks from our community uh, who uh, sometimes worship elsewhere, sometimes worship nowhere, uh, but value the kinds of things that we do as a congregation. And so uh, spend a lot of time volunteering there as well. And uh, I think that says a lot about the kind of things that we do as a congregation, uh, that there are people that come from lots of different places that want to be a part of that. So thank you for all that you do. Our ushers will assist us as we gather tithes and offerings. <laughs> Join with me in our prayer of dedication. God of love and mercy, we bring these offerings with grateful hearts, honoring your enduring guidance in our lives. May these gifts be used to nurture and uplift our community, transform our contributions into acts of love and justice, spreading your light in the world. May we always give credit to your divine wisdom and grace. In your holy name we pray. Please remain standing as you're able as we sing together.
Let us join together in the prayers of the community. Servant God, be with those who are not seen and heard in the world. Because of their gender identity or age, their class or race, their sexual orientation or relationships, their poverty or history. Open our ears and eyes to hear and see all people as yours. God of little children, be with all children everywhere, whoever their parents are, whatever their needs, that they would all be welcomed and nourished and able to be all that you want them to be. Open our hearts and arms to welcome all your children. God of love, be with all who live with fear, fear of saying the wrong thing, fear of being labeled, fear of themselves or others, fear of you. Open us all to your endless love, that it might drive out fear. Teacher God, be with us all as we struggle to make sense of your world and your word. As, our church, as your church, in our communities, as your disciples. Open our minds and hearts to learn from you. God of all, Father, Son, and Spirit, hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, offered from the darkness and hope of our hearts. We pray for the family of Bridge Radko, who recently passed. We pray for those who work and learn in our schools, who too often do so in the shadow of fear. We pray also for those who work diligently to protect our communities. We pray for all those who are caretakers, who so often are tired and feel alone. We pray for all those who live in the shadow of violence throughout our world, in Israel and Palestine, Russia and Ukraine, and so many other forgotten places that are rarely in the news. We offer all these things through Jesus the Christ. gospel lesson today moves us a bit forward in Mark's gospel in chapter 9, beginning with verse 30. Will you rise as you are able to hear the gospel? From there, Jesus and his followers went through Galilee, but he didn't want anyone to know it. This was because he was teaching his disciples, the human one will be delivered into human hands. They will kill him. Three days after he is killed, he will rise up. But they didn't understand this kind of talk, and they were afraid to ask him. They entered Capernaum. When they had come into a house, he asked them, What were you arguing about during the journey? They didn't respond. Since on the way, they had been debating with each other about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be least of all, and the servant of all. Jesus reached for a little child, placed him among the twelve, and embraced him. Then he said, Whoever welcomes one of these children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me isn't actually welcoming me, but rather the one who sent me. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. So, what is a favorite scripture verse of yours about prayer? Is there a scripture verse that comes to mind when you think about prayer? Is there something that has helped to shape your prayer life? Twenty-third Psalm. All 
was a good one. Many of us had to memorize it in Sunday school. In our book of worship, it's actually still in the King James Version in the funeral liturgy, in the memorial service liturgy, because that's the way so many of us know it. So all the other scriptures are there in the New Revised Standard Version of Bedford Yeah, Sue. The Book of Job, which we're going to be talking about in worship in a few weeks. Yeah, so uh, the Book of Job, where because his faith is tested, but he stays true. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people, um, especially if you're going through trials and suffering, find hope there. Although it's kind of weird too. But yeah. First Corinthians thirteen about love. There's, there's, there's these windows in Scripture, I think, sometimes, right? Where, especially with Paul and his epistles, where he'll be writing along and you're, he's like all over the place, right? He uses a lot of words and he's not clear. And then all of a sudden, there's those moments like 1 Corinthians 13 where it's just like crystal clear. Like if there's anything in Scripture where it's almost like God's hand guided his when he writes, right? It's like one of those moments. It's like such clarity. Yes, it's great. It's a good wedding. It's a good wedding thing. Absolutely. It was read at our wedding, too. Others, other scriptures that shape your prayer life or when you think of prayer. What do you think, when you think about prayer in scripture? <clears throat> I had a conversation with somebody not too long ago. We were talking about the Psalms, and instead of Psalm 23, we were also just talking about the one just before it, Psalm 23. Right? And some of the Psalms of lament, right? Psalm 22, that Jesus is said to be quoting from the cross. God, why have you forgotten me? Why have you forsaken me? Right? And the sense of utter despair and hopelessness that sometimes it's nice to have permission to step back and release. Right? What is it about that you struggle with, or what is it about prayer that you find most helpful and meaningful? Hope, finding hope. Yeah. Okay. Patience. Patience. Yeah, that's a big one, right? Solace. Solace. Connection with others who found solace in those prayers, yeah, or meaning or a relationship with God in some way, right? Yeah, yeah, biblical prayer, big prayer. Even Jesus wrestling in the garden, right? Like what happens on the last night? Jesus celebrates. He, he. Whether we read the scriptures that say he washed his disciples' feet or he shares a meal with them, and then he goes out and he prays. And what does he pray in the garden? God, Father, if there's any other way, please, even in that moment, seeking release from this mission that he's had such clarity about, but he knows it's going to be so utterly painful and difficult. So even Jesus in that moment, God, if there's any other way, please remove this cup from me. Please release me. So when the disciples are walking along with Jesus, and he's teaching them about what is to come, about the challenges that he is about to face, about what they are going to have to endure with him so that maybe they'll have some understanding, they really don't understand what he's talking about. And so instead, they start to have a different conversation. 
And Jesus catches glimpses of this, and he has a sense of what they're talking about. So when they arrive where they're going, he says to them, what were you talking about? He asks them, tell me about your conversation. And they immediately know that he knows. But they don't want him to know. So they're embarrassed and say, nothing. He finally admits that they were arguing about who among them was the greatest. About who amongst them was closest to Jesus, was the most important, was the one that he relied on the most, perhaps, or the one that he would look to when he was gone to take over. Leadership. And he uses that as a teaching opportunity to say to them, the one who will be the greatest is the one who is willing to be the least. And the one who will be closest to me is the one who will welcome this child. Who will welcome this child because when you welcome this child, you are welcoming me. And when you welcome me, you're really welcoming the one who sent me. That's the true openness to God that's expressed through those psalms of lament and psalms of confidence and joy and celebration and gratitude. And through the book of Job, where he is enduring such trials but remains steadfast, even as his friends say, you've got to be kidding me. Or throughout the scriptures where people, some of whom we're also going to be talking about over the next several weeks, like Hannah, goes and pours out her heart again and again and again before God. Those who are closest to God are the most open and like that child and the ones who welcome that child. The child, by the way, who in Jesus' own culture had zero status, was a piece of property belonging to their father, who was really little more than livestock. The one who welcomes, the one with no status, who is willing to have no status is the one who will be the greatest. Not because they have the most worldly power and influence, not because they have the most money, the greatest riches, the best job, the biggest house, the nicest car, but because they are closest to God in being vulnerable, in being fully open, and in doing so, being able to receive God's spirit with fullness. When I think about who Jesus is, and I'm mindful of that because my son Sam is going through a series of interviews as he wraps up his seminary experience and moves toward commissioning, which is the first step to ordination. One of the questions he mentioned last week when he was interviewed by our district committee on ordained ministry, who is Jesus? We could write a book about that, not really cover all the ground, right? Who is Jesus? Jesus is teacher, rabbi. Jesus is friend. Jesus is healer. Jesus is liberator. Jesus is savior. Jesus is master or Lord or whatever word works best for you and whatever that looks like. But for me, when I think about that question, I also believe that Jesus is a human being who is so utterly empty of self 
that he was fully consumed by the Spirit of God. And so to encounter Jesus, to walk with Jesus, was to encounter God. Was to walk with God. Fully human and fully divine. A human so empty of self that he was consumed by the Spirit of God. Something that we are called to aspire to. In our own Methodist heritage, the founder of our Methodist movement, John Wesley, talked about grace moving in three different kinds of ways. Provenient grace, the grace that is there and around us and within us and at work in us from the time of our birth, from our earliest days, before we have a conception of God, before we have a relationship with God. Justifying grace, the grace is at work as we make intentional decisions throughout our life to step into line with God. To align ourselves, to try to be at one with God. And sanctifying grace, which he said, John Wesley said, would hopefully lead us toward a Christian Perfection toward being made perfect in love. Not that we don't make mistakes, but that our motives are pure. That in the things that we do, we do them and approach them with a deep sense of humility and openness and a willingness to be so empty of self as to be consumed by the Spirit of God. That's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do in a world which says you have to be independent. You have to be able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? You have to be willing to take care of yourself. In a world that celebrates power in ways that are controlling. Not in ways that flow from humility and an openness and a willingness to be guided by God's Spirit. When we pray, when we pray, first and foremost, we should be seeking to be empty of self so that we can be filled with God. But too often, the epistle of James says, too often, Jesus says, we don't have because we ask for the wrong things. Or, what I'm too often guilty of is when I pray, I do all the talking. I do all the talking. Instead of taking time to listen. And to be open to what God is doing. In this month, I have lots of meetings here, in this past week in New Jersey, this coming week out near Auburn, and I have lots of reports to fill out and get in place and all of the other things that need to happen in the life and work of ministry. And it's easy to be running here and there and checking things off of lists and making sure that all of the tasks get done. And it can easily become threatening when what we really need to be about is being patient and humble and open to where God is moving in our midst. We'll get the report. church will go on. I've not filled out reports before. We still feed people, care for people, worship together. The lights are still on. The air conditioning still running.
does what's most important. What makes us the greatest is to do the least. True power comes in humility and in emptying ourselves so that we can be filled with the Spirit. this day with childlike exuberance, childlike boldness, childlike simplicity, and childlike faith. Go forth this day knowing that you can't do everything yourself, that you need to rely on others, and especially that you need to rely on God. Go forth this day in hope and hope.